Hi, this is the Tropical Tippet for Friday night, August 30th. We're talking about Hurricane Dorian. As always, the thoughts here are mine alone, and in making decisions, consult the National Hurricane Center and your local officials for the best information for your decision-making in your location. Well, we can clearly see here from the infrared satellite picture that we have a much stronger Hurricane Dorian than we had yesterday. Earlier this afternoon, the eye was able to clear out, and we have a very mature structure to this hurricane now. After it mixed out most of the dry air that was plaguing it, it was able to form a complete eye wall, and uh, it now looks like this. And if we look at the recon plane that just went in there, it found a pressure of 950-ish millibars, which is 20 millibars lower than a flight about six hours prior. So this is a rapid intensification event that occurred this afternoon and evening and the storm now has winds that could support it being upgraded to category 4 intensity. We'll see if the National Hurricane Center actually does that but it's probably right about there. Now uh, will it continue? A couple things uh, to notice. It might level off for a little bit. It's hard to tell sometimes with these because we're getting to the high end now, right? If it's a cat 4, uh, it's, it's sealing it, its maximum potential intensity is cat 5 if everything was perfect. But there are a lot of things that can keep a Cat 5 from happening. One of those can be environmental conditions like wind shear, dry air. We're not going to have those for very much longer with this storm. But what we might have is structural changes within the storm, internal things. Things like eye wall replacement cycles that can change the intensity of the storm even if the environment is favorable. And we might be seeing a couple of imperfections right now. One is that you can see the CDO, the central dense over overcast, is a little asymmetric, fatter on the east side, thinner on the west. There might still be a little bit of shear uh, still remaining out of the south or southwesterly direction. This is the water vapor picture. There's our upper low backing away to the west. Our storm is starting to turn now toward the west, but you can still see some clouds in the southern Bahamas and Turks and Caicos coming out of this direction toward the storm. Again, underneath of this cirrus outflow, might be just a little bit of shear keeping this a little bit asymmetric and weighted on the eastern side. The second thing that I notice is in uh, infrared imagery and microwave, which I'm about to show you, there is some evidence that there's some additional banding near the eye wall trying to form concentric bands or rings around the primary eye wall. There's a couple of additional bands that you might be able to see here. Uh, on the infrared picture. It's just kind of a look uh, that you start to notice once you've been watching these things for a while. And here's a microwave pass to kind of confirm that although we have a very healthy primary eye wall, we also have subtle bands kind of trying to merge in with the eye wall and wrap around at outer radii. And this could potentially lead to the formation of a secondary ring of sorts at some point. These are very hard to predict. When they do happen, they tend to cause a short period of weakening followed by an expansion of the storm's wind field and then reintensification afterward. If one of those happens tonight or tomorrow, we'll talk about it. It's something to watch for. But right now there's a couple hints that the storm might level off now after rapidly intensifying today. Then again, maybe it'll just keep strengthening. Uh, it can be hard to tell at the high end like this, uh, but I would guess that it levels off for a little while. There's also a slight patch of less ocean heat content prior to reaching the Bahamas before the waters get deeper and warmer again near the Bahamas themselves, and that may also contribute to the storm leveling off just a little bit, uh, but we'll see. Uh, either way, this is extremely powerful, and at this point, the storm is so strong that the details of exactly how strong kind of don't matter to you. Uh, the storm is extremely life-threatening and dangerous regardless of the minute changes in its exact intensity from this point forward. It's, uh, it's a problem no matter what. So again with the water vapor loop we have the upper low backing away and we can see that the ridge is forming here aloft southwesterly flow off North Carolina and off of Bermuda you see flow out of the northeast direction so we have this clockwise elongated high to the north, which is starting to push this storm off toward the west-northwest and eventually the west toward the northern Bahamas, where it's expected to be very close to Great Abaco and Grand Bahama sometime on Sunday. And this is a, a rapidly developing, dangerous, life-threatening situation for these islands, and the storm will likely be slowing down when it gets there. We're going to talk about that. Uh, this is the GFS forecasted 250 millibar wind speed in the upper levels of the atmosphere on 12Z Sunday. This is uh, Sunday morning, 8 a.m. Eastern Time, and this is where the storm is expected to be. We have very good agreement at this point. It's only a couple days away, less than that, day and a half, two days. Uh, we have very good agreement from the models that this is where the storm is going to be on Sunday morning. 
and uh, from this point this is where things get a little bit more complicated. Unfortunately for the northern Bahamas we have some competing steering influences that are likely to slow the storm way down. One of the things we've been talking about consistently here on these videos is this high over the northeastern Gulf of Mexico and northern Florida in the very upper levels of the atmosphere. Uh, rotating clockwise like this this is imparting a northeasterly steering influence on the storm, and this is the high that has tried to dip the storm a little bit southward on earlier model runs, and then it turns north at some point. That's what yesterday morning's European run had, and uh, some of the runs of the h Wharf and h -mon also dipped it south just a little bit earlier. Now, this high... Uh, is also is evolving roughly the same way on the models, but the storm is not. The storm has gotten slower. The storm was much faster and was already up here a couple of days ago on Sunday morning on some of the runs, but the storm is back here now. And so now that we have a slower storm, things change a little bit. So if we look at the uh, sounding for this time, we'll see this northeasterly influence from the ridge. There's that thumbnail for reference. Here's the high imparting this flow, and you can see that here in the sounding. Northeasterly flow from 200 millibars to about uh, 450 millibars in the atmosphere. Below that we have southeasterly flow, which is trying to force the storm toward the northwest and help it to gain latitude. But these two complement each other to try to force the storm into Florida at the moment, because if you have northeast wind here, southeast wind here, they both have a component toward the left, toward the west. And so both of these act to push the storm toward land rather than away from it. Now, if we look about a day later on Monday afternoon, we see that the storm has not moved very much. And here's the reason why. We have this, uh, let me go back here. To, uh, on Sunday, you'll see this trough digging in over the Midwest. You can see the sort of dip in the streamlines here. This is a little trough that's coming eastward. This is suppressing this ridge down a little bit toward the south and eroding the strength of the rest of this ridge to the north of the storm. So if we go out to Monday, you'll see this little kink in the flow there. This is our little trough, which has now pushed our ridge to west of Tampa. It's a little bit farther south. And the problem with this now is that the flow imparted on Dorian is out of the northwest instead of the northeast. So if we look at the sounding again, again here's the ridge and here's Dorian, we see that the flow is out of the northwest in that upper layer, but it's still out of the southeast in the lower layer. What's happening now is these two flows are canceling each other out. They're in opposite directions almost precisely. This results in very little steering, if any, and the storm really slows down here. So what the track ends up doing here is we start on Sunday morning. Monday morning, it's moved a little bit to the west. Tuesday morning, it's barely moved, just approaching the Florida coast a little bit, but now it's turning so that by uh, Wednesday it just slides up the coast and I just went through about a three-day period there where it took just this much journey that's a very short distance to travel in three days very slow moving storm and it's having trouble getting inland on the GFS it basically crawls up the coast here and the reason why is because this high is now fighting the storm's uh, progress westward because we have this flow uh, coming out of the west aloft which is kind of trying to keep the storm offshore we have low-level flow trying to force it onshore, but this upper level flow is out of the opposite direction and trying to keep it at the same longitude and it just rides up the coast. And the reason this is happening now, uh, different than some of the other runs that were farther west, is because the storm is slower. So when the storm arrives in the Bahamas now, we've already had time for this trough to come down and suppress this ridge farther south. These features are evolving fairly similarly to what they were before, but the storm is arriving later relative to these features. And so now the interaction between them has changed. And so now this high, instead of helping to force the storm ashore, is actually trying to keep it uh, closer to the coast or offshore on some of these runs today. Now it's important to note how subtle this is, uh, given that the storm on the GFS is right on the coast and any deviation to the left or right could mean all the difference. Here's the European run, similar thing, uh, Sunday morning, Monday morning it gets uh, toward Grand Bahama, and then on Tuesday morning, it's I mean, it's barely moved. Over two days it's done this. For a whole day it stalls here. This would be very, very bad for the northern Bahamas, unbelievably bad, and could get very bad for southeastern Florida as well if the storm approaches while moving this slowly. Wednesday morning, we have it crawling up the coast similar to the GFS, and by Thursday you can see it's moving up toward the Carolinas here. So similar tracks from the European and the GFS, but there are even some other 
uh, features at play uh, with the later part of this forecast now. So if we look at, if we go back farther in the forecast, we'll note that we have our trough number one. So Sunday morning, this is the thing that comes down, suppresses the ridge over the northeastern Gulf and weakens the ridge over the southwestern Atlantic. So this comes in and is here over Virginia on Monday morning allows the storm to come north. That's trough number one. But this trough leaves. It starts moving out to the east. As the storm starts coming north, you can now see this ridge rebuilding over the Tennessee Valley. Another ridge here. And you could imagine that this might try to force the storm inland again. If we go out though to Wednesday, we see trough number two come into the Great Lakes. This is not a trough we've really had to talk about yet because it was supposed to arrive after the storm had already done its thing and gone inland, but now the storm is slower. So we have a second trough to worry about and the second ridge over the Tennessee Valley. So on the European, this ridge is not strong enough. This trough weakens it and it comes up the coast. But the subtlety of this is very acute. If we look at the last six runs of the GFS, looking at this kind of ridge, this is all Wednesday, or Tuesday night rather, late Tuesday night, 2 a.m. Wednesday. You can see our trough number two here over the Great Lakes, and you can see our ridge, or this little thin ridge over the Tennessee Valley. You can see that the solution is oscillating. Every run is a little different. Every run, this ridge is stronger or weaker. Every run, this trough is stronger or weaker. And this ridge to the east of Dorian, trying to force it northward, is stronger or weaker. And you can see the storms moving around here. And it doesn't take a lot for this to change. We're talking about tracks now today that might be closer to the coast or maybe even a little offshore. Uh, to get it over the peninsula or even to the west side of the peninsula or offshore doesn't take much. These locations feel like they're far away, but they're not. It might feel like a track into Miami or a track into Jacksonville or a track into South Carolina are very different things. They're really not. It doesn't take a lot for a storm moving parallel to the peninsula to hit entirely different locations depending on exactly where that turn occurs. And so there's a lot of subtlety here and really we can't pin down who's going to get the worst conditions from the storm. And that's the key message today is that we've had a few model runs that are a little bit offshore, but we still have plenty of models that are onshore. Here's the H war for instance, showing landfall near the Space Coast and Daytona Beach. And this goes inland just to the west of Jacksonville on this run. The h has been very consistent on showing a landfall that moves inland. And we also have the UK Met Ensemble, for instance, that shows plenty of solutions that are well inland over the Florida Peninsula, some as far south as Miami, some even getting into the northeastern Gulf of Mexico and affecting the North Gulf Coast. And then it also has some solutions like the GFS and Euro today that ride the coast and impact all of Georgia and the Carolinas. And so the theme continues to be with this storm. Unfortunately, we, we really can't narrow down the impact area. All of the southeastern US needs to be preparing for this very seriously because very subtle shifts in this track, left or right, could affect everybody. And again, we're talking about this track that's paralleling the Florida Peninsula, so it doesn't take much left versus right 50 miles. It's all it takes, and we can't predict that well. Our day four, day five forecast error for tropical cyclones is about 200 miles. That's about double the width of the Florida Peninsula. So we really can't narrow this down. You can see it in the cone on the NHC forecast. Their forecast is similar to the forecast I just showed you paralleling the coast northward, but you can see how large the typical uncertainty is with storms like this. So it could be uh, different to the left or to the right, and honestly, at this point, we can't tell you, except that it's likely to be very close to Florida at the very least and be moving slowly. This means tons of rainfall potential, flooding, surge for prolonged periods of time, and the storm could be or is expected to be very intense during this time. And uh, this is a pretty extreme situation that people should be preparing for now. Time will start running out. The storm is moving slowly, but that time will end as we get to the weekend. We won't have much time left to prepare in the southern and central part of the Florida Peninsula. Areas farther north have more time than that. And the Bahamas are already running out of time. By Sunday morning, conditions will be t deteriorating immensely. You can also see this wind field is starting to grow in orange here. The storm might stall near the Bahamas. That doesn't mean this wind field won't be raking the Florida coastline and causing all sorts of problems, even if the storm is stalling offshore. And again, this stall could happen onshore, which would be even worse because the eye wall would then be sitting on the coastline instead with the worst of the conditions. But as it stands, there's a hurricane warning for the northern Bahamas, hurricane watch uh, farther south. 
and we don't have any watches yet for the Florida coastline, but those will likely be coming by tomorrow morning. Again, stay tuned to the National Hurricane Center and your local officials for the latest uh, information. Everyone is doing the best that they can to forecast this storm. We just don't know all the details quite yet because very subtle, small changes could mean all the world of difference. We'll hope that it remains offshore for Florida's sake. Doesn't look like the Bahamas might get so lucky. Uh, we'll hope anyway, uh, but we'll be tracking this storm uh, closely over the next few days as it approaches the Bahamas and the southeastern U.S. That's it for tonight. Thanks for watching.